Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And I think it's fair to say that as a dynasty, the Tudors had a fine line in both text and image-based propaganda. The, the last of that line to occupy the throne had, I'd argue, the benefit of learning from the very best before it was her turn to take up the mantle. And when she did, she swiftly showed herself to be the real MVP. Today, we're looking at the symbols or iconography of Elizabeth, the badges she used and the myths that she sought to be tied to throughout her reign as a way of shaping her royal identity and stage managing her interactions with both her subjects and, in some cases, with foreign powers. Now, to avoid this video being an hour or more long, I think I'm going to stick to just looking at the imagery of animals, real and mythical, that this particular queen deployed. So, the use of plants, gemstones, the connection to goddesses and indeed Vestal Virgins will, I think, need to be saved for another day and, if you're interested, for another video. So, with all that being said, let's dive right in. I was inspired to discuss today's topic after going to see the Elizabeth and Mary exhibition at the British Library, which, FYI, is set to run until the 20th of February 2022. One of the artefacts on display in this exhibition is the Chequers Ring. Now, I've shown that ring off on this channel before in my Traces of Anne Boleyn video that I will be leaving linked. Here it is. This mother of pearl ring with gold mounts containing rubies, with diamonds forming the letter E on top of a blue enamel R with a pearl beside it. This is a locket ring containing the enamel portraits of two women. One is obviously intended to represent Elizabeth and is decorated with a ruby. The other figure's identity is, however, the subject of much debate. That portrait is decorated with a diamond and the favoured candidate for who it represents is, for many, Anne Boleyn, although Catherine Parr and Kat Ashley are other examples of people who have also been suggested. I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about this ring, looking at pictures of it, and yeah, dreaming about trying it on. But the exhibition was the very first time that I've ever been able to see it in person, and my goodness, it is so tiny. The way they chose to display it also gave me the chance to look inside the band of the ring, and that's where I was surprised, because for some reason, and I did check with them, many of my fellow history geeks, and I, didn't know or have somehow forgotten that there's an extra decoration inside this Mother of Pearl band. Because when you look there, there's a golden oval, and that is decorated with an enamel image of a phoenix, rising in flames out of a ducal coronet. The phoenix was one of the emblems for the Seymour family, and this is perhaps most famously shown in the badge of Henry VIII's third wife, Jane Seymour. I will leave my video on the badges of all of Henry's wives linked in a card and also in the description box. I do think that the phoenix on the checkers ring is almost certainly not going to be a callback to the woman who replaced Elizabeth's mother as her father's wife and queen in the days after Anne's execution, because frankly that would be insensitive and I imagine highly likely to cause offence. Instead, it's thought that it might connect to the person who gave Elizabeth the ring, with the suggestion being that this ring, which dates to around 1575, was a gift from Edward Seymour, Earl of Hertford. That in doing this, he was likely following a fashion for commissioning and displaying images of Anne that emerged during Elizabeth's reign, and that he chose to mark his gift with one of his family's emblems that also, helpfully, may have been one of the devices that Elizabeth liked to use for herself. I believe the mythical capabilities of the phoenix are fairly well known, but for clarity, the phoenix dies in flames and is reborn from its own ashes. For some, it's a symbol of sacrifice and rebirth that is connected to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And if we hop back in time, I do think there is something tragically prophetic that Jane Seymour chose this familial emblem for her badge as queen because her success in bringing her husband's most longed-for kind of new life to his Tudor line resulted in her physical destruction. If we travel back to the reign of Elizabeth, however, it seems likely that she enjoyed the phoenix symbol for other reasons. Because I think she would have liked, for example, that there is only one phoenix ever, and that that phoenix is associated with the sun. So here we have a creature, connected with the brightest light in our universe, who also happens to live a solitary and wholly chaste existence. The phoenix lives for centuries, and as it feels itself approaching death, it builds a nest out of aromatic wood. And side note, some medieval spice merchants would apparently claim that cinnamon could only be found in a phoenix's nest. And they use this, apparently, to justify its screamingly high prices. Once this nest was built, the phoenix then ignites itself and its nest. From the ashes, an infant phoenix emerges, identical to what came before, but as it was at its own birth. I can certainly see how this would make a pleasing fantasy for the unmarried queen. Everything would just be a lot simpler if Elizabeth could reproduce herself, wouldn't it? The phoenix also appears on the reverse of this medallion containing the bust of Elizabeth. The phoenix in flames sits beneath the queen's royal monogram, which itself is placed beneath the crown. Both crown and monogram are being touched by heavenly light. The bust and its reverse relief are surrounded by an enamelled wreath of green leaves and stems from which red, white and Tudor roses appear to sprout. It's not clear who commissioned this piece, which is dated to somewhere between 1570 and 1580. Clearly, it is designed with Elizabeth in mind. But was it made for her to wear or for her to see? There is also a portrait of Elizabeth wearing a phoenix jewel, although it's clearly not this one. It is, nevertheless, equally spectacular. The jewel is no longer extant, if it ever actually existed in the first place, but from the painting, it appears that what is being shown is a gold and enamelled phoenix in flames, where the heart or base of the fire is represented by a gemstone mounted in gold. Perhaps that gem is a garnet, but more likely, I think, is that it's a ruby, particularly as rubies are connected to both knowledge and female virtue in the Bible. The phoenix jewel in this portrait sits beneath, or potentially hangs from, an enamelled Tudor rose with a massive diamond at its centre. Diamonds are shown as being black in the portraiture of this period. And it's also possible that the Tudor rose and diamond mashup are part of the gold, pearl, ruby and diamond collar that's being worn by the Queen. Many have read this as an intentional echo of the collars worn by her father, Henry VIII. The phoenix portrait is associated with Nicholas Hilliard and is dated to around 1575. It's also closely connected with another portrait from around the same time that is also associated with Hilliard, the Pelican portrait. Placing the two portraits side by side, I think it's clear that they are connected. They kind of look like mirrored paint by numbers that have been finished using different colours. There is probably a better way that I could have expressed that, but I can't think of it right now. So if how I just described the similarity between these portraits in any way sounds like I am downplaying the phenomenal skill that went into creating these works, or indeed the beauty of the finished pieces, please know that that was absolutely not my intention. Either way, I do hope you can see what I was attempting to get at with that statement. If we compare these portraits, we can see that the heavy collar of jewels from the phoenix image has been exchanged for ropes of pearls. These pearls appear to connect with a large table-cut square diamond that's set in gold and edged with filigree. Hanging from this diamond is the pelican pendant. The pelican is shown like the phoenix with its wings spread, but this bird is not in flames. 
Instead, it is shown to be pecking at its bleeding breast while being surrounded by three juvenile pelicans, presumably its offspring. This quartet look like they are perched on a rectangular red gem that's set in gold. And as with the phoenix jewel in the previous portrait, I would suppose that this gem is most likely to be a ruby, but equally, it could potentially be a garnet. So why a pelican? The story went that in order to feed their young, a mother pelican would be prepared to rip open her breast so that her offspring could feed from her own blood. This process that saved the babies would, however, kill the mother. And from the medieval period, this image of the sacrificial pelican was read, perhaps unsurprisingly, in connection with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Through Christ's sacrifice and the spilling of his blood on the cross, people received the promise of being saved for eternity. For Elizabeth, then, the symbol was potent and useful. The sacrifice of the mother pelican had been connected to the divine. This virgin queen would have no children of her own flesh, but she was still keen to present herself as a mother. And this happened even during her first parliament of 1559. When her government pressed her about the need for her to marry and produce children, Elizabeth replied that while it might happen that God would, quote, incline her heart to that kind of life, until that did happen, she would remain happily a virgin and, quote, a good mother of my country. Elizabeth contracted smallpox in October 1562. It was feared for some days that she would die. Her counsellors, unsurprisingly, panicked over the potential succession. And when she recovered, her parliament once again petitioned her to marry. Elizabeth, in her customary style, danced around the issue. And in her response of the 28th of January 1563, she finishes on the following statement, quote, And as I assure you all, that though after my death you may have many stepdames, stepmothers, yet shall you never have any a more mother than I mean to be unto you all. Like the sacred pelican then, there would be nothing that this Elizabeth would not be prepared to sacrifice in her role as mother to her Protestant nation. The next painting is created a decade after the supposed production date of the Phoenix and Pelican portraits. So this one is made in 1585. It is the Ermine portrait. In it, we see a fabulously dressed Elizabeth with a little Ermine appearing to climb up her forearm. This ermine has a bejeweled crown around its neck, as was common for heraldic beasts in achievements of arms. On the table beside Elizabeth and her ermine is the sword of state. Ermines are part of the weasel family, and they are perhaps best known for their white fur and their black-tipped tail. For centuries, their fur was reserved for the monarch and for the members of their immediate family. The fur, in fact, still appears on royal regalia, such as the ermine-lined robe of state that our monarch wears for their official state duties, such as attending the state opening of parliament. Although there have been a few occasions in recent years where that particular ceremony has been more pared back and Her Majesty the Queen has not worn the full robes of state. The ermine also comes with a legend. It was said that an ermine would rather die than allow its white coat to be soiled. For this reason, the creature became a symbol of purity and virginity. With its fur synonymous with royalty, and its legend one of fiercely guarded purity, I think it's fairly easy to see just what the ermine offered to the Elizabethan image-shaping industry. Here we have another portrait of Elizabeth with an animal, which I would like us to look at. This portrait is thought to have been created slightly before the ermine portrait, so perhaps in around 1580 to 1585. However, there are some that argue that it may have been created later than that. It is known as the Wanstead or Peace portrait. The house in the background has been identified as Old Wanstead House, which was purchased by Robert Dudley, 1st Earl of Leicester, in 1577. It is thought that the Earl commissioned Marcus Geararts the Elder to make this painting. 
it has been suggested that his second wife, whom he married in secret and much to Elizabeth's displeasure when she found out about it, may be one of the figures in the background of this painting. And if this is the case, then perhaps we are seeing Dudley's fantasy of acceptance for his marriage and potentially of a hoped for forgiveness for his wife, Latisse. I do have a video on her that I will be leaving linked as well. As it was, that hoped for forgiveness from Elizabeth would never come. In this portrait, Elizabeth is shown to be holding an olive branch in the manner of Pax, the Roman goddess of peace. She stands over the sword of justice as well. A small lapdog sits at her feet, and the connection between dogs and loyalty is certainly many centuries old. Its presence in this portrait may therefore be Dudley's assertion of his loyalty to Elizabeth, clandestine marriage notwithstanding. However, if Dudley is the true commissioner of this piece, then the dog may also be a callback to a time when Elizabeth reportedly told her favourite, quote, You are like my little dog. When people see you, they know I am nearby. Arguably then, the dog functions a little bit differently to the other animals we've looked at in this video because it seems that it might be communicating a message to Elizabeth rather than solely being used to shape an image of her. And certainly in this portrait, Elizabeth is being framed as a goddess, as a garden of justice, as a being deserving of unceasing loyalty. But in the little dog, there is also potentially, arguably, a specific representation of Dudley's own promise of loyalty, that this is an image-based message, a vow, if you will, that that loyalty will be continuing and unceasing. And Dudley's not the only person to do this, this isn't the only time that this happens, because if we fast forward to around 1599, we will see another of Elizabeth's subjects who is using animal imagery to speak both of and to the Queen. Here we have the Hardwick portrait, which may have been commissioned by Elizabeth Talbot, Countess of Shrewsbury, who is perhaps better known as Bess of Hardwick. I do have a video about that fine lady, which I will be leaving linked. It is thought that this portrait was finished in around 1599. This date is supported by an entry in the Hardwick accounts regarding a payment for the carriage of a portrait from London in 1599. Descriptions of the frankly fantastical contents of Queen Elizabeth I's wardrobe have led some scholars to suggest that the gown the Queen wears in this painting might have been a representation of a gown that she actually owned. That she had this skirt that contained a veritable menagerie of animals, creatures from myth and reality, from the land and the sea, that adorn her underskirt where they are interspersed with a variety of flowers. If Bess of Hardwick is responsible for this, she has commissioned a painting that proudly announces her queen's dominion over both land and sea. A host of butterflies seem to flutter attractively around beside songbirds, as if to draw the mind to the sights and sounds of a Tudor knot garden on a glorious day. Other native birds are also represented. We have a goose, a swan and a kingfisher. The swan has the added significance of being a royal bird, the property of the queen herself. There are two snakes slithering across the skirt, and they both appear to be investigating the whale that sits between them, which is fairly fitting as the snake was often used as an emblem of knowledge and learning, a pursuit that was known to be close to Elizabeth's own heart. We know that this queen was enviably learned and skilled. A factor that's interesting to me is that the creatures of the land, the birds, the butterflies, the snakes, the frog, granted frogs are amphibious but still not from the sea, and also the lizards, are rendered in what looks like fairly recognisable fashion. If, on the other hand, we take a look at the sea creatures, I don't think we can make the same claim. And, of course, this might be explained because these creatures live in the sea and so it's simply harder to be able to render an accurate artist's impression of them. Nevertheless, it does seem to me that almost all of these sea creatures are being presented as if they are a focus for fear 
and trepidation. That being said, I don't think the whale is being shown in quite the same way. But the other sea beasts are, frankly, nightmare fuel. Take these sinister looking critters with the creepy razor tooth smiles and the spikes all the way down their back. They are supposed to be dolphins. The sea also apparently contains a dragon with wings and a whole bunch of sharp teeth and tusks. And then there's this thing. Now this one has me stumped, but I'm thinking it might potentially be a particularly upsetting representation of a sea lion. Maybe. So I think we have to ask, why would this portrait contain imagery like this? Well, perhaps we can provide context when we think about the fact that as many of Elizabeth's seaborne explorers and privateers would end up finding to their cost, the sea itself could be a very dangerous place. But it was also a place from which a human threat to Elizabeth's realm and to her person might come in the form of an invading enemy force of the kind that had been threatened by the Spanish Armada in 1588. So perhaps we can read the decision to put all of these terrifying beasties on Elizabeth's skirt as a form of containment. Such is the power of Elizabeth, of Gloriana, that she can see off the most frightening of threats. Indeed, perhaps the fact that her left hand is shown to be resting on a frankly monstrous, arguably the most scary and highly betusked sea creature on the whole skirt, could be read as an assertion that Elizabeth has taken all seaborne threats against her realm and person in hand. The art historian Roy Strong referred to there being a cult of Elizabeth that was shaped through multiple mediums, but prominently through the iconography of her portraiture. The animals we have looked at today form part of that iconography. Strong argues that in the gap in visual stimulus that was created by Reformation, where holy icons and vestments were removed, and the colourful faith-based art that adorned the walls of places of worship was defaced and whitewashed, images of Elizabeth could provide a replacement for her subjects to worship. Gloriana could step in. It's compelling, and in the case of the portrait of Elizabeth, it's certainly something that might have played out at court and among the nobility. People who could afford to commission their own portrait of the Queen, people who had the space to display it, and or the position in society that would grant them access to view these pieces on the walls of others, or hanging at court. Public art galleries would of course not exist for many centuries. That isn't to say that Elizabeth's subject had no access to her image. I mean, they might see her in person, on a royal progress, or they might see or own an engraved print like one of these. Now, while these images might look a little plain, because they are colourless, it's important to remember that there are many examples of engravings like this being coloured in, for want of a better term. So while the engravings clearly have the capacity to be stuffed full with symbolism like the portraits, they are not capable, I would argue, of being able to match their magnificence. For one thing, engravings will be smaller than most portraits, and that's excluding, of course, miniature portraits, whose diminutive size is part of their magnificence. But this size difference will ultimately mean that less stuff can be shoved into them. Additionally, I'd argue that as a medium, engraving doesn't offer quite the same level of flexibility as something like oil paint. For example, you aren't going to be able to see the glimmer on the silk, or the gleam on the diamond, or the individual hairs of the fur in an engraving. Beyond the rarefied circles of the court, there would arguably be less access to the extreme visual magnificence of this kind of portraiture. So perhaps we can, and indeed should, question just how far-reaching its power could actually be. I mean, is it possible that we, who have access to these images in real and online galleries, could be even more affected by their power than your average bricklayer from York in the 1590s, say? Are we still part of the cult of Elizabeth? And if we are, 
could it affect how we assess her life and legacy? Certainly, this is a question that scholars continue to debate, and it's something that they also have to wrestle with in their own practice. But what do you think of the symbolic animals we've looked at today, of the notion of there being a cult of Elizabeth? Would you like me to do a video on some or all of these symbolic elements found in Elizabethan portraiture? And if so, what part should I explore next? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can come and find me over on social media. I'll leave links to the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, so follow me over on some or all of them so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, why not share it with some friends? And please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. Now, I saw a comment last week from someone who was patiently waiting for a YouTube notification of my Friday video and it never came. And when they checked, they had been unsubscribed from the channel. Shock, horror. So do have a check to see if the same has happened to you. And while you're there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, why not also hit the bell icon beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.